Our next guest today is Tamás Henning, who is the Director of Security Engineering at Marquetta and also Exercise Advisor. Tamás is ready to talk to us about a vulnerable part of our population that needs to be protected in virtual worlds, our children. I know that as a parent myself, when I sit next to my child who's playing a game and I have no idea what they're experiencing, all I know is that they're emotional, they're involved, and I'm, me sitting on the couch does not help. So parents, educators, regulators, product developers all have a role to play to keep them safe. And Tomas has, can hopefully outline a path for us to make sure no harm happens in the virtual world. So this will be a 20 minute presentation and questions in the last five minutes. Take it away, please. Hey everyone, so I'm Tomas. Um, the goal of this presentation is not necessarily to jump immediately to solutions. The goal here is to make sure that we don't forget about certain cases and certain scenarios. And we talk about the things that is not obvious that we need to be talking about. So let's talk about yesterday. Um, this photo is a photo of my hometown, and it was actually taken in 1994. Um, and it wasn't really hard to find. I just put in my hometown's name into Google, and this showed up. I, I actually grew up literally right next to those particular buildings. But what's really interesting in this particular photo is there are very little people in it. And there's a lot, a lot less photos about this particular point in time and that's by design. It's not because the photos themselves weren't taken. It's because the frequency of when these particular photos were taken was reserved for special occasions, right? But when we talk about today, cameras are everywhere. You, most likely, every single one of you here has a camera in your pocket, at least one. I at least have three because thank you, iPhones. But um, there, you have to think about the a lot of the positivity those particular cameras have brought into today's society and today's world by allowing the world to be smaller and a lot more uh, connected. And, but that also brought in side effects. That brought in the fact that some childish mistakes that the young kid is making now may be forever immortalized on the internet, on social media, and everywhere else. So how do we make sure that the content that is on the internet is actually content they want, we want to be preserved forever and forever and not, uh, and, and, and not forgotten about over a period of time. But tomorrow is XR. Um, and I want to make sure that we talk about certain things here knowing very well that what we're doing today is going to be immortalized till forever, especially in an XR world. XR allows for amazing experiences. It really allows for... Uh, things to be built and designed that you have never really thought about. For example, like we were talking about like going to Jupiter and experiencing Jupiter, experiencing weightlessness, experiencing what it would be to throw a baseball that never stops and just goes and goes and goes and goes. But we need to make sure that we're actively discussing about the implications around these particular experiences and the devices that we're using to experience these wells that we're building. So, there's a lot of data that goes into in a, any particular device, and there's a lot to talk about this particular slide because if I take on, if I put on a device, it can track my eye movement, it can track my uh, uh, whether my eyes are open or closed, it can even potentially read my uh, whether I have a fever or not, or how widely are my pupils dilated, what are my iris characteristics, what about my face, what about the different ways that I tilt my head and why. What can be potentially done with these particular da data sets? We really need to be talking about it. But this isn't new, to be clear. Even today, a lot of people don't know this, but even today, the accelerometer data off your mobile phone is very likely used in fraud models and payment systems. So when you send that PayPal or that Venmo, very likely that accelerometer was pulled in order for them to actually determine whether it's a fraudulent transaction or not for a variety of different risk reasons. Well, what about the biometric data? What about when we're in a position and in a place where now the way you tilt your head, the way you do certain things is now uniquely identifying you? And it's not a identifier that you can change. It's not like you're going to change your physiognomy, physiognomy overnight. Let's talk about apps. 
apps are amazing. They can deliver unique experiences that are extremely inclusive. Like we, we heard from Niantic about Pokemon Go. It's absolutely amazing to be able to go out on a walk and share and then catch Pokemon left and right. Or imagine a world that you built in Minecraft and experiencing the scale and the build that you built yourself. And, and going through that world, it's absolutely breathtaking. Or going through New York City or any particular tropical part of the world and experiencing it in real time. But it comes with its own hazard, right? There's many, many articles here, Roblox, any other uh, companies really know this and have experienced this, that it can be used to do harm. Now, what about in the, uh, in the XR space? What if I start cutting in every 200th frame an image that is extremely disturbing and we don't even notice it as part of our regular consciousness, but our subconsciousness picks it up? What about teaching, right? We lived in COVID world for the past almost two years now. Being at home taught us a lot of different things that virtual learning is possible. But at a young age, we learn with our eyes. We learn to believe what we see and what we experience. How are we going to ensure that what we teach is in reality what reality is in, is in itself? And what is right versus what is wrong? If I'm in a VR world and fall down, I won't get hurt. But if I fall down in the real world, even off of this stage, it's quite likely that I will get hurt. How do we make sure that these things are actually talked about quite a lot? And as I've spoken about it, is the, the virtual domain has a lot of real world threats. If I walk, this off, walk off of this ledge, or if I'm in a game that asks me to move and I don't know my immediate surroundings, I can walk off here and actually hurt myself. So making sure that these things are being taken into account and talked about seems obvious as I'm talking about it, but it needs to actively be implemented and talked through in many different ways. But me walking off this stage is very obvious. There's a lot more less obvious things and situations that actively need to be thought through and discussed and by policy to an extent limited as well. So with XRSI, we're here to actually do a lot of work and help build safe and inclusive immersion environments. And it's going to be incredibly important to make sure that we have these conversations in a way as things are being built, these things are actually being taken into consideration. It starts off with privacy, starts off with safety, and it starts off with identity. <clears throat> so we started uh, on a journey to put together a privacy and safety framework. And this work started I'm going to say more than a year ago now, where this is just the first iteration of a standard that people could be really thinking about, because we need to start off with the data. If we know the data can be handled correctly and can be really safeguarded, then the rest of the things and experiences can be a lot easier um, manipulated and handled and, and discussed through every single, every single channel. So let's make sure that we start off with assessing all the data that is actually being collected by devices. Let's make sure that we understand what the data can actually mean to a lot of different things. And we assess the risks associated with all that data. We inform. It's incredibly important, as I was talking to a lot of different parents and other kids, it's extremely important to make sure that we inform the different use cases and the different ways devices themselves and experiences themselves are being built. And parents are really, really aware of what can go well and what can go wrong. And then we manage. Uh, a lot of training, not only for the companies themselves around who are building these type of experiences and tools and platforms, et cetera, but for the audience, the young audience, the parent, the teacher, the world that we're going to be living in, actually the metaverse that we, we will likely be living in, how do we work and behave in that particular environment? Because it's going to be very different than the world we live in today. And then the last piece of it is going to be prevent. We need to make sure that we're preventing really, really bad behavior. We need to make sure that we're protecting our youngest minds of the world. And we put in the right controls because um, without those, it's going to be wild, wild west. And we, we saw what the internet was in the 90s and the early 2000s. So we really don't want that. Um, and uh, preventing harm. Um, this is very, very important because especially with our youngest uh, audience here, harm is super easy. And we want to make sure that they have the best experiences of their lives. And 
not the worst experiences of their lives. I was actually super speedy because I got to my end. And again, th the goal of this talk was not primarily to give you solutions, but to start conversations about topics. So I actually allocated half of my time for questions because I like conversations and not just speaking. So if there are any particular questions, I'm happy to answer about this topic. So specifically in the XR space, how do we go about creating these standards where it matters, which is especially within apps on headsets that kids might be using, when they're pretty much able to artificially disclaim any responsibility for that because the headsets themselves, the hardware, are saying we are only for this age and above, even though we know that the users are younger than that age? Um, I think that's putting your head in the sand a little bit, at least from my perspective. We need to we need to really, really, really acknowledge the fact that uh, teen ratings and ESRB ratings themselves are only guidelines, and people will start using things when they're not really meant to. Just take a look at your past. Very likely you had a sip of alcohol before the age of 21, because that's how you experience. We need to really understand the fact that there are going to be kids that are going to be playing video games that are not suited for them or rated for them. So the way we can solve for this is by really making sure that the training material is there for the parents, for the environment, to safely experience that world. It's about guiding, and it's about safe learning and having that safety net, and not simply absorbing yourself of responsibility just because you said this device is uh, rated 18 plus. Hey, Tomas. First of all, thank you so much for you know, starting this conversation. Mm -hmm. Super important. Uh, this question, and I think you know, I had already asked you this question before and we reflected on it, and maybe you have uh, some more thoughts on this. This, com this question comes straight from uh, the staff of Kathy Castor mm -hmm. that we talked to while we were advising them to do COPA, Ch Children Online Privacy uh, Act reform. And uh, while we were reflecting on, you know, how to advise them, the question they had asked is like this whole idea of 13, you know, and above. And uh, the senator staff and people, they want to stay ahead of how to, how, how do we make sure this like age appropriate design type of thing happens when we can't even ensure that the kids are they are who they are. So one is like currently what's going on, and then are there any technologies or have you had any new thoughts as to how are we going to handle this in the immersive technologies? Mm -hmm. it, that's a really, really great question. Um, and it all boils down to the question of identity. Identity is one of the most difficult questions that we need to solve in, in the next 10 to 15 years in the internet because here you know I'm Tomas because I'm physically here, I can show you my ID, you can physically touch me and, and verify that I am me, but when I'm on the internet, how do you actually know that I'm Tomas, I'm not using a voice changer, that I didn't take someone else's identity, et cetera. So there's a lot of work that needs to go into actually verifiable identity in, on the online internet, on the online world. The, the age of 13 is such an arbitrary number. It's, it's, it doesn't necessarily mean whether someone is, is, is a young adult or a young teen, et cetera, because there are well-defined growth phases of a specific child, and there needs to be uh, a lot more thinking going into how to better target the types of devices that are going to be for those specific age groups and age ranges to make sure that they, they, they are taking the relevant tools and and experiences that is appropriate for that specific range and not just an arbitrary number. Saying that um, you need parental consent at, at, a, at a nine year old, yeah, you know, that's gonna be super easily bypassable, but if you are able to somehow verify the identity of that child and recognize the fact that yes, they are a child and there are ways that they, they're gonna be enabled to, to experience the internet and the AR, VR world, is gonna be enabled, they, they're gonna, not want to lie about who they are. What, what, why do 13-year-olds or sub-13-year-olds lie? It's because they get blocked. Let's not block them. Let's enable them. And if we enable them and actually guide them down through a particular path of learning and development, it's going to be way better for them. It's just human nature. If you block me, I want to do it more. Exactly. And then just one more question, if I may. You know, uh, 
e-safety commissioner in Australia, they are trying to build the children's code. And as you know, we are actively trying to advise them. So what advices from the children's safety perspective can we present to them um, with respect to XR? Because they're trying to codify you know, exactly that, 13 plus. But these immersive technologies, the arbitrary number doesn't apply. So do you think that we should tell them to do more research or what is this basic like, you know, and I'm obviously gonna follow mm -hmm. up with you and we're gonna sit around, but just, you know, for the sake of audience understanding, how are we thinking about advising uh, globally on these things? So globally um, and strategically, one of the big things that I'm really, really thinking about is making sure that the, the way the regulation thinks and the, commission, the commissions and the different agencies think about is one of three folds. It's you need to work with the companies and the companies need to come to the table. You need to work with the families in order to make sure that the families themselves really understand the world that we're gonna be going in. And the third is the educators, right? The educators are, are incredibly important, especially in the, in the child's development phase because that's where we learn what is right versus what's not right, what is okay to do, what is not okay to do. So tackling all three elements in a very, very different way towards the same consensus goal is gonna be very, very important because only together will we be able to really deliver the message home of, hey, like these are our youngest minds, we need to influence them towards what is right versus what is not right. And I know what is right is really subjective and, and and not necessarily an easy one to answer, but if we were able to do it in real world society of like differentiating between, hey, hitting a kid constantly in the school is not okay, why would it be okay in, 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 an, in, in a virtual world, in a metaverse? Like we need to learn how to behave as societable society uh, people. Just one last question, mm -hmm. Mas, and that is again for the benefits of our audience is, you talked about with an XR safety framework uh, about prevent. Why is prevention so important in immersive technologies? As I mentioned before, there's a lot of bad things that can happen in the, uh, in the immersive technology space. One of them is you could just convince me to walk off this particular uh, ledge or you could do a lot of like the, change the way I'm thinking about today's world. Um, we learn through immersion, that's who we are. The easiest way to learn a brand new language, even for an adult, is to immerse yourself into a brand new language. When you're a kid and you believe with your eyes, if you not prevent and you don't get ahead of like malicious applications, really abusive applications, et cetera, you're prime, you're prime setting up your own youngest generation to think very, very differently than what is society's norm today. Hi, um, I'm working in pediatric healthcare in VR, mm -hmm. and uh, I just wanted to mention that um, I think a lot of what you're talking about is really well researched and well, there's a lot of information and helpful data that can come from pediatric healthcare. Mm -hmm. We obviously have to go through a lot of this stuff in, in great detail, especially in um, through uh, research ethics and, and getting ethics approval, but also just in hospital policy and stuff like that. And there's just a ton of experience in de dealing with kids when they're particularly vulnerable. So uh, I just wanted to kind of open up the concept of maybe crossing uh, silos a little bit and working a little bit with us in the medical community as well to look for uh, ideas and ways to, to work with protecting kids in XR. Uh, absolutely, and I welcome that idea. The, the more research that can be done in this particular space, the better, because it will actually allow us to better understand like, how all of the re potentially even like, regulations, frameworks, standards that we want to put, put out there can actually be influenced to be better. So I always welcome collaboration. Um, I'm, yeah, this has been really interesting, and I do keep kind of coming back to the idea of prevention. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> You know, just because based on a lot of social media right now, it's hard to imagine that content moderation is going to go well. It doesn't go well now in like very simple yep. interactions. Um, and I don't think that any algorithm is necessarily going to solve that problem. So is it more something that is hardware based in terms of like getting a, a better system for identifying or actually like uh, making sure that a person's age is their age? Or is it just kind of normalizing the idea that like any space that you would have your child go to, you know, you start 
that teaching process by going with them to normalize the idea that if you're, they're going to be in, interacting with people in XR, that you begin those processes with them somehow. I, I strongly believe it's, it's a mix of both, right? Because you need some level of technological uh, safeguards in place as well. You can't have technology not be there. But education and being there is absolutely key. There were so many conversations I had with parents where the parents had no idea about the game that the kid, their kids were playing, and that's not a good thing. The parents should be there alongside with them, really understanding the, the world that they're in and helping shape their particular journey and making a lot of resources available for the parents to learn as well about these particular environments is extremely key. So it can't just be one or the other. It needs to be both, and it needs to be both in such a way that it's, it's like what is okay for me not necessarily may be okay for you. So it does leave that specific uh, knob that people can tailor of what is appropriate for your child versus my child, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, very eager to see how it all evolves. Thank you. Me too. Thanks. Hi, um, I have a question about censorship in the metaverse, specifically about different categories of stuff. So, for example, some parents might be okay with their kids uh, playing games that have mm -hmm. shooting and killing and stuff like that, but don't want their kids to see pornography, for example. So, yep. I grew up with like Mortal Kombat and, and GDA and stuff like this, which has a lot of killing and a lot of blood, yep. but sort of pornography was not a thing that was allowed in the house. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, um, will, do you think will companies offset the censorship to the parents and to the users? Or will there be a global sort of censorship where everything, like certain categories are just not allowed in the metaverse? So, th that's an amazing question. And these are a lot of the conversations we need to be having with companies like Meta, et cetera, on figuring out how the differences between what is OK for you and what is appropriate for you may not necessarily be appropriate for me and vice versa. It's to very much early days because there may be disagreements around what is okay versus what is not okay. And if truly this is going to be a worldwide phenomenon, we need to somehow figure out and be as inclusive as possible because it is a diversity thing around what is okay for you versus what is not okay for me. So I don't have a great answer for you right now beyond the fact that it's super duper early days. We need to actively be having these conversations as things are getting built. And I think I have time for one last question. Oh, guess I don't have time for last question, so thank you. <laughs>